This is London Calling in the European service of the British Broadcasting Corporation. This is London Calling. Ici Londres. <laughs> Hundred and forty two. Another Christmas when there is no peace anywhere on earth. Another Christmas when goodwill towards men is crushed in the horror and brutality of total war. For three long years we have fought a black, relentless fight to win a way of life. And tonight a light is shining on our path. Tonight the way to victory is clear, and we are set on that way. Adolf Hitler spent Christmas in the Wolf's Lair, his hideout in East Prussia, trying to relieve his depression by taking sedatives and listening to records of Beethoven. Less than three months before, he had boasted in an order of the day on the Eastern Front, the enemy is already defeated, he cannot rise again. By Christmas Day, Hitler knew that he was wrong. The Red Army was on the verge of a great victory at Stalingrad. The god of war, Hitler told one of his generals, has gone over to the other side. Christmas night, 1942. Pause a moment to salute and greet that great army which tonight strikes its massive blows across the frozen rivers and plains of the east. Within the past few minutes, it has been announced that the Red Army has passed to the offensive southwest of Stalingrad and has advanced from 20 to 25 kilometers. Greetings to the fighters of the Red Army from London and from the armies of Europe. Hello, this is in all parts of the world. This is Wilfred Pickles talking to you from the canteen of a munitions factory somewhere in Britain. Some of these men and women here are going to tell you about the arms they are making for Russia. The arms that are helping our great and heroic ally to throw back Hitler this winter as they threw him back the last. Well, now, the first one we'd like you to hear from is George Fryer, who worked on Valentine Tanks. What do you lads think about Russia, George? Russia, I tell you, if a fellow is seen slacking in the shop, somebody's only got to go up to him and say, I wonder if they're doing this in Stalingrad. You don't have to say any more. He goes home. <laughs> yes, to our fellow workers in Russia, we'd like to say this. On behalf of our factory, we express our gratitude to the men and women of the Soviet Union. Not in words, but with tanks, and still more tanks. We pledge ourselves to produce the weapons you need, and by our collective efforts, we shall crush our common enemy for good and all. And now, as a tribute to the men who are using the arms we're making, the gallant men of the Great Red Army, I ask you to rise for the International. The tide of war was turning in North Africa as well as on the Eastern Front. In November 1942 came the dramatic news of victory at El Alamein, the battle which Churchill called the Hinge of Fate. This is the BBC Home and Forces programme. This is Bruce Belfridge. Here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour in the form of a communique from GHQ Cardo. It says, the Axis forces in the Western Desert after 12 days and nights of ceaseless attacks by our land and air forces are now in full retreat. Their disordered columns are being relentlessly attacked by our land forces and by the Allied air forces by day and night. The Eighth Army continues to advance. It may almost be said, wrote Churchill at the end of the war, before Alamein we never had a victory. 
After Alamein, we never had a defeat. Soon after Alamein came the Allied landings in French North Africa, and Churchill ordered the church bells, silent since 1940, to ring in triumph. Germans have received back again that measure of fire and steel which they have so often meted out to others. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. <laughs> We're making this recording in the desert in a stony wadi in Tripolitania. As a matter of fact, we've just stopped for the moment and with a small unit here, we're just listening to the wireless from London, the Christmas Day program, sitting around here on the stony slopes with one or two men of an armoured unit. And uh, I've got one or two of them sitting around me. I'm going to pass the microphone around to them. One man, I'll just take them at random, one man here next to me. Where do you come from? Richmond in Surrey. How are you? Is it your first Christmas in the desert? Uh, yes, sir. How are you feeling about it? Oh, it doesn't feel so good at the moment, but I'm waiting for our dinner to come up. Well, I hope it comes up all right. I know that you'll be, on this day in particular, thinking about the folks at home, and although this is no name, no pack drill, perhaps you'd like just to say Merry Christmas to them. Yes. Hello, Mum. Hello, Dad. Happy Christmas to you all. Give my love to Nelly and Derek. Well, there's no name to that, but perhaps it'll ring a bell with the family to which that voice belongs. Most of the soldiers in the desert got their Christmas dinner. The 8th Army at Christmas 1942 consumed 40,000 pounds of Christmas pudding, 8 tons of mixed nuts and thousands of Egyptian turkeys. Most units were also able to listen to the BBC. In the desert on Christmas Day, reported the Times, the King's speech was admirably clear and listened to intently. For King George VI, his Christmas broadcast was both a deeply moving occasion and a personal ordeal. I don't begin to enjoy Christmas, he wrote in his diary, until it's over. While the king sat alone before a microphone at his study desk, the queen and the two princesses listened in another room. It is at Christmas, more than at any other time, that we are conscious of the dark shadow of war. We miss the actual presence of some of those nearest and dearest without whom our family gatherings cannot be complete. As he spoke these lines, the King was thinking of his youngest brother, George, Duke of Kent, killed in a flying accident while serving with the RAF a few months before. Over the Christmas holiday, the King put his own affairs in order. Ever since George's death, he wrote in his diary, these matters loom large in one's mind. But, he added, outwardly, one must be optimistic about the future in 1943. And it was in this spirit that he finished his Christmas broadcast. This year, it adds to our happiness that we are sharing it with so many of our comrades in arms from the United States of America. We welcome them in our home. And our sojourn here will not only be a happy memory for us, but I hope a basis of enduring understanding between our two people. For the American GIs in Britain, it was their first experience of a British Christmas. On arriving in England, they were given a booklet warning them not to criticise the food, the beer or the cigarettes, and explaining that the British didn't usually speak to strangers in trains or buses. Their British hosts sometimes complained that GIs were overpaid, overfed, oversexed and over here. The GIs eventually replied that British troops were underpaid, underfed, undersexed and under Eisenhower. At Christmas 1942, a different mood prevailed. GIs were invited to Christmas dinner in English homes, sometimes forming lifelong friendships with the families they visited. Many American bases gave parties for English children with unobtainable treats like ice cream and candy. The BBC did its best also to cement the wartime alliance. A toast! A toast! I would like to propose a toast! Just a minute, everyone. Just a minute. Someone wants to propose a toast. Hello, it's Esmond Knight. Esmond Knight is one of Britain's leading young actors. 
He served in the Royal Navy and was in the action when the Bismarck was sunk. In that engagement, Knight was blinded. I want to give you a toast, America. This little island is filling up with men and with women who are going to lead with their left and swing with their right. Someone else is going to have a sore chin from now on. Things are beginning to happen. There's been a lot of talk. Now we're going to let the guns speak. You get a man's kick out of it. If you could see what's going on over here, America, you can't go anywhere in Britain today without coming across it. That feeling in the air. Ships, aircraft, guns, munitions and tanks. More and more of them every day. And men. Men are pouring in from the four corners of the world. The four corners of the world in arms. Black men, white men, brown men, men from everywhere and from the back of nowhere. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you a toast. The men and the women of the United Nations. Brothers in arms! Happily, there was light entertainment too at Christmas 1942. Radio's youngest Christmas entertainer was Petula Clark, who became a star overnight after appearing on a Forces Request program a few days earlier. Other Christmas entertainments included some bizarre party games for the Forces, Gilly Potter's account of Christmas at Hogs Norton, Victor Sylvester's dancing lessons, and Billy Kay's impersonation of a land girl. From this program, we now send you forces wherever you may be, a message in song, and in particular to Gunnar Reese in Iraq. Here's your niece, 10-year-old Petula Clark, one of the sweetest children you ever saw, to sing you, When I Love, I Love. Oh, when I look for love, I cannot live without thee. Oh, when I look for love, there are so ways about thee. Oh, when I fall like fool, and there's no thought about thee. If my lips they look to you, they only spell you lies. Look at me and you will see. A bike, a bag, pipe, and a pike. 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 A bike, a
from David Miller. Is everybody listening? It's time for 40 minutes with the BBC Dancing Club. Each week at this hour, Victor Sylvester will give a 10-minute dancing lesson for all listeners who wish to learn to dance. Followed by half an hour's dance music by his ballroom orchestra. And now meet the director of the club, Victor Sylvester. Hello there, everyone. We give you another hearty welcome to our dancing club. This evening, I'm going to begin by telling you how to do the natural turn in the waltz. There are six foot movements in the natural turn, and the easiest way to learn them is to do the six steps in the form of a square. As usual, we'll start with the man's steps. One, forward right foot. Two, side left. Before I'm half awake And I know how many beans make five And when a duck's a drake Oh, and oh, what have you done for me? world's best-known comedian was in a more serious mood at Christmas 1942. Charlie Chaplin broadcast from Hollywood to the people of Lambeth where he'd grown up. Although I left London 35 years ago, I shall always remember the top room at Three Pound Hall Terrace where I lived as a boy. Now they tell me that Pound Hall Terrace is blasted by the German Blitz. I remember the Lambeth streets, the new cut, the Lambeth walk, Vauxhall Road. They were hard streets. And one wouldn't say they were paved with gold. Nevertheless, the people who live there are made of pretty good metal. And all through your days of trial, I was thinking of you. Your poverty, your unbeatable courage, and your humor. That courage and that humor saved Lambeth. They helped to save London, and they will help to save the world. They can't do this to us, you said, and they can't. Now you're seeing if they can take it. And they can't. Don't let me be said to the Germans When our victory is ultimately won It was just those nasty Nazis Who persuaded them to fight And their Beethoven and Bach Are really far worse than their bite Let's be meek to them And turn the other cheek to them And try to bring out their latent sense of fun Let's give them full air parity and treat the rats with charity, but don't let the beast be to the hum. Another Lancaster dropped a load of incendiaries. And where, a moment before, there had been a dark patch of the city, a dazzling silver pattern spread itself. A rectangle of brilliant lights, hundreds, thousands of them, winking and gleaming and lighting the outlines of the city around them. It was a fascinating sight. As I watched, and tried to photograph the flares with a cine camera, I saw the pinpoints merging, and the white glare turning to a dull, ugly red as the fires of bricks and mortar and wood spread from the chemical flares. We flew over the city three times for more than half an hour, while the guns sought us out and failed to hit us. At last, our bomb aimer sighted his objective below, and for one unpleasant minute, we flew steady and straight. Then he pressed the button, and the biggest bomb of the evening, our three-and-a-half-tonner, fell away and down. I didn't see it first, but I know what a giant bomb does, and I couldn't help wondering whether anywhere in the area of its, of its devastation such a man as Hitler, or Goering, or Himmler, or Goebbels might be cowering in a shelter. 
It was engrossing to realize that the Nazi leaders and their ministries were only a few thousand feet from us, and that this shimmering mass of flares and bombs and gun flashes was their stronghold. Okay, Jack, don't worry. Everything's all right. Anybody hurt? The wireless operator just copped it. Badly? No, I don't think so. Only in the leg. The job is done. But the dangers are by no means past. The skipper of F for Freddy discovers that the speed to one of his engines is 40, and that only by great care and skill can he maintain height. And as the homeward journey progresses... That gentleman is good old England. And I must say, I'm damn glad to see it. Pardon me, General Hanley, but I, I think we should discuss our tactics. Oh, I see. Now, for example, um, what should you do if you spot an enemy plane directly overhead? Well, if you see the pilot open the bomb bay, duck. The pupil's training is complete, and Doyle listens to his last instructor for the last time. In a few days, you'll be joining your squadron. One day soon, you'll be flying, and you'll see in the distance many dots. Your mind will refuse to accept that these are Germans, but they will be. They will be men intent on one thing, killing you. It will be the first time in your lives that you face the killer. Then, gentlemen, you must keep cool. Watch the swastikas on the plains grow larger. Soon, white puffs will come towards you. Then you must say to yourself, keep cool. Keep cool. Keep cool. Hold your fire. You are piloting a plane proved over and over again better than the other fellows. You have been trained with a care and a patience that he has never known. Keep cool and you will win. Goodbye and good luck. By 1942, the BBC's Christmas broadcasts went to most parts of the world. Before the war, the BBC had broadcast in seven languages. Now it broadcast in over 40. And among its overseas broadcasts at Christmas 1942 was a special message to the children of occupied Europe. Christmas is the children's festival because it celebrates the birth of the best and bravest child in recorded history. That child, Jesus of Nazareth, was a Jew, and his mother had to flee from her home because Herod, the fascist dictator of that part of the world in those days, was, like Hitler, murdering the Jewish children. We know here in Britain how brave and strong the children of the occupied countries of Europe have been. We know how splendidly they have resisted the attempt to make them into little Nazis. And my message to the gallant children of Europe today is this. Remember your own unhappy Christmases, not so that you may be bitter and revengeful and make Christmas a misery for the children of the future, but so that you may do all that you can to make sure that your children may have happy Christmases. Ring in the valiant man and free, the larger heart, the kindlier hand. Ring out the darkness of the land. Ring in the Christ that is to be. Good luck to you. Although you have suffered, the future will be brighter. For out of the ruins of Lambeth, out of the dust of all your bombed cities, will rise a New England, where poverty will be inexcusable and charity offensive to the dignity of a people who have, by their blood and tears, won the right to be profitably employed and to live decently in a more enlightened and progressive world. God bless you, Lambeth. <laughs> 